That's a big, big job, but we know that the prize is a change of culture in the marketplace. We know if we take on the Babylonian culture that has run this planet since, since Cain and Abel, literally since then, we're going to have a backlash. But our job is to stand and overcome that backlash, and the Lord wins those victories for us. Hey, before we get into this episode, I just wanted to let you know that we're doing this episode over two parts. Reason being is when you get somebody like Dave, who's built a $2.2 billion group and counting, you kind of want to get as much out of him as you can. I want you to get as much value from this podcast as possible. So I actually took an hour of his time and just peppered him with questions. So today is part one. You'll get through a whole heap of information. And then next week, I'm going to be dropping you part two so that you can watch it in installments and get the value. All right, let's go to the episode. Well, guys, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. And let me just say, this episode is going to be fantastic. You need to strap yourself in and hold on, because I think uh, by the end of my time today with our guest, uh, you will be stretched, challenged, maybe even a little bit offended. We'll see how we go with this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, we're going to be chatting with my good friend, Dave Hodgson, who um, this is no... It, this is no small call. I would say has a handle on kingdom economics like nobody else in the world that I've experienced. Um, and that, hasn't, that has come from divine revelation, his time with the Lord, and it's also come from outworking. He is doing and has been doing what the Bible says to test it. And, uh, and that has meant that he has proven uh, what the Bible says about wealth creation and kingdom impact and influence. And so... You're hearing from somebody who has had a lot of battles, a lot of scars, um, and a whole lot of victories. Um, and I want to I want to talk about the victories because he deserves to talk about them. But I also want to talk about some of the battles and some of the scars because that's what's ahead of all of us if we decide to play a big game. Hey, Dave, it's so good to have you on the Kingdom Business Podcast. Why don't you give us a bit of insight into who is Dave Hodgson? Okay. Thanks, Wes. Good to be on board. Um, Dave Hodgson, just an ordinary guy, really. Um, grew up in Africa, <clears throat> grew up as an indigenous guy, really, a white indigenous guy, and learned all about the bush and stuff. Uh, ended up getting sent to boarding school at a very young age. That's where those scars that Wes was talking about started from a multiracial society down to South Africa, which was an apartheid society. So I got my brains beaten out for talking to black kids. Anyway, whatever. Grew up a little bit, got sent to uh, my parents moved to Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, and there uh, there was a huge war going on. So when I finished school, ended up fighting in the special forces, the SAS and the Salu Scouts for many years, a decade, in fact, until the war ended, and then ended up in Singapore as a commercial saturation diver. And eventually I got into Australia in the uh, early eight, mid-80s and um, became a Christian in Perth and then... Uh, moved eventually to the Sunshine Coast and started a business. So that's Dave Hodgson in a little nutshell. That's awesome. Now you skipped over a whole lot of miracles and stuff like that. So we're gonna, we're gonna go back, right? So your company, Paladin Corp, um, I think it's been called that as long as I've known you, which thinking about it is something like 15 years. Uh, we've traveled together and done a lot of events and things like that. So as long as I've known, it's been Paladin Corp. I guess I wanna know, I want to know what is that company and what are you hoping to achieve when you set it out and now? Okay, so Paladin Corporation was originally started. It, it was Paladin Australia for about a year <clears throat> and it was started solely to fund our church. That was its only purpose. Church was in dire financial distress and three of us got together with a view to actually funding the church. So we did that and uh, we did it through property development and so on. But ultimately, we changed the model um, slightly and moved off, well, quite largely moved off property development and went into business acquisitions. And the reason we did that was because the Lord showed us that we, he, he wanted more from us than just funding the local church. The local church was the first port of call because we needed a strong spiritual covering. The church needed money. We wanted the spiritual covering, just a beautiful symbiotic relationship. So we did that, achieved that. And then the Lord showed us what our real assignment was, what our obligation was, why he created us on earth. And it was to, to grow a big corporation to have influence. My two business partners at the time didn't want to do that. So I bought them out. And I since carried on acquiring businesses and growing the company into the assignment that the Lord gave us. And the assignment was 
to create the world's first modern day sheep nation, as in Matthew 25, sheep and goat nations, which required a massive cultural change in the marketplace. And so that required a lot of influence, a lot of money. And so we built this big company. It's one of the biggest in the nation now. And we buy asset value anyway, at least. And then uh, with that, we are now changing culture and creating that modern day sheep nation as a benchmark for other nations to look in and see, how did you do that? Wow, look at this, how did you get rid of unemployment and domestic violence and homelessness, et cetera. So that's the short legacy of our company. Fantastic. I want to go back to something. I have the privilege of knowing a lot of the backstory, right? So I could go back and go, mm, I don't want to skip over bits and pieces. The trouble with you is your memory is too good. That's right. So careful, right? Um, <laughs> um, you just said that you started Paladin Corp for the sole focus of funding the church. Yep. I want to go back to what your life looked like at, at that time, right? So, you know, you know, moving from up North Queensland to now, I know car broken down, one loaf of bread, no clothes. And I just want you to sit there for a minute and go, I just want you to let us know, how do you, how do you sit in a place that's nothing but sheer struggle and nothing's working and you're literally broke to catching a revelation of I'm going to start a business for the sole purpose of my church? It's this, it didn't come from, you didn't, you didn't have enough and then decide to fund your church. You had nothing and didn't fix your own issues. You funded the church. Can you just talk into that bit a little bit? Because that, that's wildly different to the way most people live. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> okay, so back in uh, 2019, um, sorry, 1989, um, I was given a prophetic word at the church that I was at, which was about 2,000 kilometers to the north of where we live now. And I'd been in that church for about 11 years by then. I was the senior funder of that church, and I knew that because I was on the board, I was running a business. Up until that point, I'd been in business for, I think, 22 years. I had never, ever gone above $2 million per annum in revenue in any business I'd ever tried. And I think I'd had about nine businesses by then in six different countries um, at different times, not all together like now. And the um, thing was, I was always working in my own strength, but I thought that I was doing enough. Hey, I'm a kingdom guy. I'm funding the kingdom. I'm funding my church. What more can God want? You know, so that's what I was doing. But then I got this prophetic word. And the word was based on the fact that our pastor and, and husband and wife, two pastors, had been transferred here 2,000 kilometers away to, re to fix this church, which was in financial distress. So they moved from our church after 10 years to come here. And then six months later, uh, an elder in the church came and said to me, I had this vision last night. This couple came out from Africa and uh, they stood with Pastor Dan and Pastor Anne, who had left six months ago, and they built a mighty church. And so I said to the guy, John was his name, I said, hey, John, that's awesome. My son Storm and his wife are going shortly to go and help. Storm was a youth pastor. Shelley, was a, his wife, was a music director. Uh, what, a, what a pleasure. They're going to go and help Pastor. And, and this John said, no, no, no. This couple came from Africa. Shelley is an Australian girl, Aussie chick. Uh, this couple came from Africa. It's you and your wife, Merlene. Then he turned and walked away. I said, John, get back here. And he said, you deal with it. I'm just telling you that. Anyway, that was me getting my assignment from God, but I didn't know that. And back in the 1990s, nobody was teaching on assignment. Marketplace ministry was in its infancy. And I just thought, well, either John's got it wrong or God's got it wrong because if I leave this church, it's going to collapse financially because I'm, I'm funding the thing. So, but you know what? The church prospered and I collapsed financially. And that's because God wanted to get my attention. He had an assignment for me. He had trained me up for 43 years. I was 43 then or 44 then. He trained me up all those years to come and do something and I wasn't going to do it. So I didn't, I wasn't intimate enough with the Lord to understand he was giving me something to do. So for the next two years, he gradually stood me down until my business completely dried up and I, and I never did anything different. So it wasn't me. It was the Lord just screwing down the tap, trying to shut down the cash flow to get my attention. And then ultimately after two years, I sold everything. I sold my clothes, I sold our knives and forks just to pay cash, uh, to pay wages, drew all the credit cards down to pay cash. And then eventually I said to my family, well, we better go and do what God told us to do because we've got nothing left. So we had one old car left, an old Land Cruiser that was boiling its head off. We traveled every 300 Ks. We had to stop and let the thing calm down. And we were hungry, hungry. We had one loaf of bread for three of us to get down all the way. I think it took nearly four days to get there, nearly yeah, four days. And we were hungry, man. 
fish uh, chips, you know, to buy chips was a, was a real treat. Anyway, when we got here, within three weeks of going to the church that the Lord had sent me to, I had now got a job as a builder's laborer. I was earning $5 an hour at kids in school. I had a massive credit card debt, $76,000 credit card debt, and big interest to pay because I drew cash. And this pastor came through the church on a, on a Sunday night, and he was uh, Dave McDonald. He was the director of Christian Outreach Center for the nation. So he's a big shot, and he didn't know me. I knew him. He calls me out the audience and says, you, sir, the Lord has shown me that you there's finances written all over you, and you will write six-figure checks for this church in the near future. So there it was, the confirmation of what John had given me two years earlier. You must go and stand with the pastor and build a mighty church. The pastor had come because the church was collapsing financially. You, sir, finances are written all over you. You must write $600,000 checks for this church. So I was in such a place of financial distress. There was such a famine in my land. But the confirmation was so awesome. And fortunately, my wife was sitting with me, so I didn't have to explain mm -hmm. anything because that would have been hard. I said, oh, wow, okay, so John was right, okay, Lord, that's awesome, let's do it, and I had no means of doing it, no way of doing it, because I had no money, only debt on the balance sheet, and I, I went home and just switched my whole world from builder's labor to how will I make 100 grand for this church, and we just went through the newspaper and looked for all kinds of jobs, anything that we could find that where I could make, I'm an entrepreneur, so for me, it's like, okay, what's next, you know, give me, give me, and eventually we found Aussie Home Loans. They wanted one broker and I managed to get that job. And once I got in there, I learned how all the banks worked and I figured out how to buy property at deep discount on a rising market. And, in, and within two years, we were funding that church to the six figure and more. And I had a, a, my business had grown, you know, to a hundred million dollar company in two years and seven months, which is way beyond my two million dollar limit which I had been up to until that time. God applied his favor. The favor goes with the assignment. I was doing the assignment and look what happened. So that's essentially what Wes is alluding to. Hey, I'm not sure if you heard, but I've got an event coming up called the Kingdom Business Summit. We've been running these since 2012, all over Australia, been in the US and New Zealand, and there's one coming up real soon. And I invite you to grab your tickets, whether you attend in person in Brisbane, Australia, or on our live stream. It's two and a half days of the most practical kingdom business training you could ever imagine. I'll be speaking through how to scale up your business. I've got Olympic medalists. I've got the father of the marketplace movement, Ed Silvoso, dialing in. I've got a, a, a couple of local entrepreneurs who have built significant businesses. There's going to be a time of networking and a time of fun. It's going to be a phenomenal, life-changing event. To find out more, just go to kingdombusiness.com global kingdombusiness.global it's the most preeminent event you could ever go to the most practical event you could ever go to and we're going to have a whole bunch of fun all right grab your ticket soon i look forward to seeing you at the event let's go back to this episode what year did you get the prophetic word that you're right six figure checks uh 2001 two years after 1999 so um 21 years later um, are you prepared to tell us the value of the group as it sits today? Yeah, it's about $2.2 billion <laughs> in terms of asset, net asset value, maybe a bit more. Anyway, we might revisit that, but I just wanted to kind of put a bow on the fact that that story, you know, like, like that's not a huge amount of time, 21 years, right? And, 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 yet, and yet it's a phenomenal outcome from minus 76,000 to 2.2 billion. And, you, and I feel like you're just getting started. Soon you'll put in some big days. Um, <laughs> and um, now, now I, I don't reckon it could have been that easy, though. I, I want to go back to surely there were moments when you've been given the prophetic word. You're on five bucks an hour trying to navigate rent, mortgage, kids at school. Were there moments that were like, have I lost the plot? Merlene's your beautiful wife's saying, Dave, we need like food and stuff like were there those moments? And if so, what were they really like? Yeah, for sure. And it took a long time to actually convince. I mean, Merlin always wanted to come to the Sunshine Coast anyway. She didn't want to live on the Atherton Table. And it's a very hicksy rural area. So she wanted to be a city girl. So she was quite keen to come under any circumstances. But once we got here, it was it was really hard. Five bucks an hour is nothing. I was actually earning $15 an hour, but I had a, a guy working with me who was a druggie. His wife was having threesomes, believe it or not. It was killing him psychologically, smoking more dope. So he was getting, I gave him $10 an hour and he had five. 
But at the end of the day, it was purely a temporary thing. I, I knew there was more to it because I was here for a, for a greater cause than that. So when I got that prophetic word and it was a case of, okay, let's, here we're looking now from blue collar to white collar, more potential, then and my wife was on board and it was a case of, okay, what are we going to do? So once we homed in on becoming a finance broker, it didn't take long to actually break through. It was a three-month lead time to getting paid in those days. The Lord really honored it and looked after us during those three months. But, but I very quickly made good money as a finance broker and became an authority because the Lord showed me I needed to learn all the banks and all of their policies, not just the normal five or six that most brokers learn. And that soon manifested as to why. But the, the point being, once I was prospering as a finance broker and the Lord showed me he wanted more, my wife was up in arms and was saying, don't take the risk. You know, why would you shut down doing that and go and do crazy things? when, you know, this can be such a good business. And, you know, my wife was working with me by then. We'd gotten too big for one person. So employing had uh, PAs and things. She was very against it. And, but I knew the Lord was talking and I had learned to listen by then. I said, Lord, all right, I'll do it. Don't stand me down. And at that time, he wanted me to teach the, the other kingdom entrepreneurs what we had done, how to fund our church and why. So Kingdom Investors, which is now called Kingdom Initiatives, is a marketplace ministry, that was born. That was taking a lot of time and a lot of money away from the family budget. And so I had the hassle of trying to work with my bride on that. And then, of course, came business acquisitions and, you know, they can fail and they do. You buy a business, you find it's full of Babylon and uh, then you've got to stay with it because people have invested. So, you know, we had hard, hard times in, in the very first acquisition. Once we bought it, we found the thing was totally corrupt. It was a women's health club full of members that were illegally on the books that we were still charging, weren't allowed to. We had to forfeit them. We had to let them go. We didn't have to. We did it morally because we don't want to be run at odds with the Lord, especially when I'm teaching ethics and business on the kingdom side. So we had to let them go. That took all our profit away. And now we're running at a loss. Uh, you know, investors are going to lose their money, massive stress. All the attacks of the enemy came our way. But as long as we stuck to the assignment, as long as we stuck to doing God's will, which is the assignment, and doing it God's way, which is righteously in business, and I'm not talking about you know, being pious in church, I'm talking about righteously in business, then the Lord provided and he just kept on putting his favor, which led to the multiplication. So we had those battles all along, but ultimately it's the perseverance. It's not he who gets knocked down that loses, but he who fails to get up or she who fails to get up. And that's one of the biggest keys in the marketplace, even as a kingdom operator. And here we are today, having, having won those battles. There's still more battles ahead. We know that, you know, we're, the regulators are always after us. The tax office is always after us and so on. And it's a big, big job. But we know that the prize is a change of culture in the marketplace. We know if we take on the Babylonian culture that has run this planet since, since Cain and Abel, literally since then, we're going to have a backlash, but our job is to stand and overcome that backlash and the Lord wins those victories for us. And is that where you learnt intimacy with the Lord, real intimacy, in those early days when it was all going bad, nothing made sense, you know, pressure cooker environment? Like, did, did you, because I, I know what your life looks like now in terms of intimacy with the Lord, but but was it then that you went, I'm, I'm just going to go all in because everything else hasn't worked? Like... What was that moment that switched for you that said, I'm going to walk very, very closely with the Lord? Uh, it was around us. Yeah, it was at that time. It, it was really, you know, the, the time when we had gone broke and were driving down, I was sort of, you know, talking to the Lord all the way down. It's a long drive and the car keeps boiling and you keep stopping. So I, I was talking to the Lord a lot on that trip down, you know, why, Lord? And I wanted answers. It wasn't screaming and yelling Pentecostal prayers. It was, Lord, why does it happen this way? What is it? How come I never knew? For what? Why did it take me two years to figure out what you're saying, when, especially when you designed us in your image so that we could communicate because we're the only living organism anywhere on earth, anywhere in the world that can even understand the spirit world and communicate. So that's, that kick-started it. And then obviously um, during that period when the Lord was, when I had that three-month lead time, the Lord was showing me stuff in business that I had to go and help poor people, and yet I was one of them. 
okay? And I had to go and help them every night with uh, help them get their loans and things like that. And I wasn't getting paid because their loans were too small because they were poor. But the Lord was teaching me all of that. And I needed to listen and, and learn. So I did spend a lot of time, Lord, so why? What does that mean? Not insolently, investigatively, okay? Doing a spiritual due diligence, essentially. But at the end of the day, that triggered it. And then soon after that, um, as the company, about two years later, as the company grew to around about uh, you know 100 mil, that was when my pastor said to me, you really need to go and take a whole day to go and pray uh, because your company's going so big, it's going to come under attack. And I just thought, man, he's a pastor. He's mad. You know, not that all pastors are mad, but why, who in the world's going to take a whole day to go and pray when you're running a big company? It was big then by my standards. Anyway, another pastor told me the same thing, and then an intercessor told me the same thing, all in the space of three weeks. So I thought, I'll better go and do it. And ultimately, that led to what we have nowadays, which is pray days. And I take a pray day every week. Tomorrow is my pray day, a Wednesday whenever I can, but sometimes another day if, if I'm away traveling. And we even have an international worldwide day of prayer at KI, at Kingdom Initiatives, where there's over 750 business people coming online and praying and Facebook streaming and so on. But those pray days, guys, I can't do without them. I run 32 companies. I run one of the biggest and most influential marketplace ministries on the planet and a big family. I've got 11 grandkids, two great grandkids, one nearly born again. So it's a big, busy world, but I still go and take that day because I need to know from God. I'm creating the world's first modern day sheep nation. No one's done it. How am I going to get details? Nothing to read, nothing to ask, nowhere to listen, no Google. I've got to ask the Lord and I better listen and do it the way I do it his way. So that's why it's intimacy is directly related to your productivity, guys. I can guarantee it. And I think that's why I wanted to go back there because there'd be people that are listening to this right now, driving in a car, running on a treadmill, mowing the lawn. And it's easy to hear Dave Hodgson, 2.2 billion. Um, but their life might be like, um, my, you know, my wife's not understanding what I'm saying. Um, I can't win a client. I've got no money. I've got a dream that every, like, like everyone thinks I'm mad. And I guess I wanted to stitch up for those people listening that, that, the, the mistake most people make in that place is they think they need a business strategy to fix it. Whereas, and that could be the case, but I would suggest we probably start with a spiritual strategy of intimacy with the Lord. And out of that, you'll get a business strategy and out of that, you'll get to fix it. Um, but I think a lot of people in the pressure cooker miss the invitation to step up their intimacy with the Lord. And they think another cash flow strategy will fix their issue uh, yeah. in, instead of an intimacy strategy, yeah. which is what you did. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at lots of people in the Bible, just take David when, you know, that famine was in the land for three years. He wasn't looking for a more, a bigger paddock to grow more crops. It was, Lord, why is there a famine? What's happening? You know, and I don't know how he lost those three years. He should have asked on year one. But ultimately, the Lord was able to say, hey, dude, this is how, this is why, go and fix it. Joseph, how did he interpret those dreams? You know, there's so much of it in the Bible. They were so intimate with the Lord. Yep. So we've just spoke about your prayer life and you do an entire day a week focused. Um, and like you said, you, you go to learn things. You're not there just, I mean, you might be singing beautiful songs, but I mean, like, but you're there going like, I, I want to know why this, why that, how does this work? You know, and, and so forth. Right. So that's amazing. But, but your nature is really quite disciplined. Now it probably comes from years in the armed forces and all those kind of things. Um, Give us an idea about the other disciplines in your life, like like your routine. Obviously, I know that fitness is a massive thing for you. It always has been. What role does that play in staying sharp and, and being, being able to run the long game? Because, I mean, you're 20, you're 20, however many years in now, but you've got 40 more to go as a minimum, right, before you hit second gear. So, like, give us an idea about your disciplines and what, what is a day looking like for you? Okay. So I learned discipline as a young age, obviously as a four-year-old getting sent to boarding school and, and it's regimented. And then in the military, the same thing. But, you know, it's, and then as a saturation diver, you know, you're 400 feet below the ocean for 35 days at a time. There's no room to, to mess around and get mess up routines and things. So I learned all of that along the way, but it, it's, there's also different personalities. Some people are disciplined, some aren't just by nature. I'm just naturally disciplined. But the benefits there far outweigh anything that I can think of. And so, you know, my body just wakes up at about quarter to four, 3.45 a.m. every day. 
And then I go to the gym. I used to go and pray first for an hour and take communion and so on. But I found that I started nodding off. So I go to the gym first and uh, then now I'm wide awake. So when I get back, I can pray and take communion and whatnot. I make sure I take communion every single day of my life. Okay. And then, you know, it's brekkies and, and um, wake up my bride and so on. And then off to work here at Paladin or wherever I'm going. So that's, for me, it's a very full day. I work three time zones because Paladin is all over the world and so too is KI. So I'm often lecturing, you know, it might be 11.30 p.m. Um, because that's just when the when the, the UK and Europe are online and we need to be lecturing there or doing business there or whatever. So I've kind of learned to get by on four hours sleep over the last probably 12 years, I suppose. So midnight until sort of 3.45. I am changing that. I never lecture on balance because I'm always out of balance. So, but I'm kind of changing that so that I get more sleep because I know that I'm like halfway. Strangely enough, at 66, I, I've always known I want to be live to 130, and uh, there's so much more. I'm too busy to die. So there's that side of it. The fitness side is really important. I learned that at a young age. It's important brain-wise, body-wise. I don't have time to get sick. And I, they're just literally my mindset is I don't need. To get sick i just don't have time to get sick so i make sure i keep fit I train you know for an hour every day in the gym i was an olympian in 1972 selected for the munich games and i just that and then the, obviously sas and then the salu scouts those are all ultra fit type organizations so i just it just was built in but it has huge benefits guys this is supposed to be the temple of the of the lord and we we need to create temple people if we're going to create temple cities the temple being sheep uh, solomon created the world's first sheep nation which started with the temple that he built okay so it was a temple nation and it's the same deal with us and you know people can let themselves go but become lethargic and not achieve their full assignments and be dealing with ailments instead of babylon and and you know the devil is so pleased when everybody's ill um uh, that's exactly what happened during first century palestine the, the 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 priests and the government the sanhedrin wanted the nation medically sick just like COVID. Okay, they wanted the nation medically sick, so there could be no uprising when they plundered them. So the devil loves that. So we should be strong and healthy as much as we possibly can within reason, shouldn't be an obsession, but certainly it helps you achieve your assignment in my mind. But you're not getting up in the morning and jumping in your car and driving down to the local 24-7 gym to be hounded by everybody there, right? How do you yeah. do it? Well, I live in a unit now and the gym is just downstairs. And at that time of day, no one's awake, which is awesome. But prior to that, I had, a, you know, several acres and but still had my whole, had three carports, three garages, car parks, uh, converted into a gym. A gym has always been a big part of our family. Every ship that I worked on when I was a commercial diver for four years, I built a gym. I welded up plates and made a gym offshore, <laughs> doing bench press through the blooming storms and things. But everyone used to come onto my gym. So I've always just done it. I don't like going to a commercial gym, literally because of just what you said. Everyone comes and says, oh, Dave, how do you do this? How do you do that? And I want to help people, but I don't have time. And it's a waste of my time to do that in a gym. So I'd rather train at home. Well, how was that? That's a lot of value. And, uh, and he's certainly a guy that is walking the journey. He's all in for the kingdom of God. And he's putting his activity where his theology is. Don't forget that the next part of this conversation will drop in a week. And, uh, and I'm doing that because I want you to get as much value as you possibly can from these podcasts. All right, make sure, put it in your diary, that next Monday morning, 6 o'clock Queensland time, part two of this conversation will drop and you'll be able to pick it up then. Bless you.